Hi, thank you guys so much. I'm so I'm so excited to be here. This is my first time in Sweden, and um, it's a it's wonderful an adventure. I was just saying to to David last night, is everybody in Sweden this nice? Everybody has been so kind, and I'm so excited. I love talking to different groups of of activists and and seeing how much we how much we have in common, and it really it inspires me to see the energy of the movement all around around my own country. I travel around the United States quite a bit, and around the world. Um, so today I'm going to talk about understanding the psychology of meat, the mentality of meat, for effective vegan advocacy. And I wanted to start out with this quote. Have you had a chance to look at this quote? Take Just take a moment to read it over, if not. I choose to use this quote because I think it really perfectly uh, exemplifies the classic conflict that marks the human response to suffering. It's that tension between denial and awareness, between numbing and witnessing, between silence and proclamation. So as the renowned psychiatrist and traumatologist Judith Herman tells us, most people respond to atrocities by turning away. But some people are willing to see the truth of what's happening, and these people feel compelled to speak out and to break through the denial of others. And these people are the activists and the advocates. Advocates, They're on the front lines of a social movement whose goal it is to attract a critical mass of supporters to tip the scales of power. And these people are, are you. Um, and if you think about it, you're in really good company. Throughout human history, virtually every revolution for justice and nonviolence was made possible by the witnesses who refused to accept the denial of an oppressive system. I mean, what is a true revolutionary if not one who stands up against atrocities? And one day, and I really believe this day will come, when the vegan movement, the animal rights movement, has achieved popular support then vegan activists will not be seen as radicals, but will be recognized as revolutionaries, will be recognized as heroes. So um, before we get started, I want to just hear a little bit about your experience. And I'm going to ask you some questions during this, this workshop. How many of you in your own experience notice this people turning away from atrocities? Have you seen this before? OK, so the response is, you know, to, to learning about veganism, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. And how many of you also can identify with this feeling like compelled to speak out, like you want to have people see the truth? Can you relate to this? So then, in your experience, when you do speak out, how do people respond? What do they, do they say, Thank you for telling me the truth about animal agriculture. I had no idea. I'm never eating meat again. Thank you. What's your experience like when you speak out? Does anybody want to just give an example or, or share something of what you notice? Yep. Well, sometimes they will listen, but usually it comes down to the, um, it, the fact that they like meat and they will continue to eat anyway. Okay, so sometimes they listen, they hear you, and they say, oh, that's, that's horrible. That's true. And then the next day, they're at the McDonald's drive-thru. Right. Okay. That's a good ex I've heard that a lot. I've seen that a lot myself. Anybody else want to talk about like what happens? Are we getting this on tape, or do they? I can, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, usually it's very defensive, and almost always with a joke. A joke. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so you notice defensiveness. Sometimes it's enough to just say, I'm vegan. And people get this, right, this hostile reaction or this defensiveness or make a joke about eating animals or something. Eating the food of animals. Right. But they can taste so good. Does anybody else will take one more? Yeah. Yeah, often they ask questions back, like, where do you get your proteins from and what should we do with all the animals that uh, we don't eat? Stuff like that. Right. Well, well, we have to eat the animals because if we don't eat them, then the world will be yeah. overrun by farmed animals, <laughs> and people will have nowhere to live. Think, yeah. But that's a that's a pretty common uh, response. 
Right. It's, I, I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? It's, it's not logical, but it's such a common response, and people aren't recognizing that it's not logical. So, you know, you'd think we, you know, probably can relate to this feeling. It becomes really frustrating when you hear the same thing over and over and over again, and especially when you think about how, you know, the vegan message or veganism should be such an easy sell, you know? I mean, we're advocating compassion and health and moral consistency, but the way that people respond to the vegan message, you'd think we were advocating Nazism or something. It's bizarre. So. We have this incredibly important message, but so often our message gets lost, like we end up silenced. Can you relate to this? Kind of trying to communicate again and again and just feeling like communicating becomes almost impossible. So the question is, you know, as vegan advocates, our goal is to transform denial to awareness. How do we do that? given the reaction to the vegan message. And so that's what we'll talk about today. So first we're going to talk about, you know, why do people deny atrocities in the first place? Why is it that people who really do care about animals and care about the truth and really do want to do the right thing in many ways tend to turn away? It's this paradoxical, illogical mentality in so many ways. Thank you so much. Okay, I forgot to mention in the beginning of this talk that um, if I use a word that doesn't translate perfectly or accurately to, to ask me, I'm glad you asked me that. So the question was, can I explain atrocities? Um, an atrocity is a mass collective trauma. Like an example would be the Holocaust or slavery. An atrocity is something that's a very, very, uh, a violence, in general, this is the way we use the word in English, violence that is carried out against a group. Does that make, is that clear? <laughs> what Google Translate said what? Cruelty. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, cru cruelty? Yeah. In plural, oh, we don't have a plural for cruelty. So, oh, this is good. See, I should have studied Swedish before coming over here. Um, yes, okay, so cruelties. Um, we probably should have a word for a plural for cruelty. Um, so we'll talk about this paradoxical mental mentality of meat. And then we'll talk about how, how do we use this understanding to advocate more effectively, how do we transform denial to awareness? Because that's really the goal of the movement, of all social movements, if you think about it, or at least an important part of the goal. So we'll talk about advocacy um, principles and communication skills, and also taking care of ourselves. Because living as a vegan in a non-vegan world, as you probably know, can be challenging, can be difficult. If we don't take care of ourselves, then we are not responsive, but we're reactive. Then we can't think about our response, but we just react automatically. And often we can react with anger or with sadness, and our reaction can get in our way. And the good news is that with awareness and practice, we can significantly increase the likelihood that our message will be heard as we intend it to be. So this, is, this can be learned. And there's a lot of wisdom in this room. A lot of you have practiced what I'm going to be talking about and have experienced what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll ask you at some point to share some of your own knowledge. OK, so let's begin. Why do people deny atrocities? Well, I want to start out with a very short video um, that is from, it's, a, it's the trailer for my book, just a short example of what's in my book that gives an example of this paradoxical mentality of meat. Imagine your new neighbors have invited you to dinner. Rich aromas fill the air and wine and conversation are flowing freely. They'll never forget to read the fine print again. This <laughs> <laughs> is delicious, Bob. Thank you. I've never tasted anything like it. Tell us, how do you make this? Sure. First of all, you start with three pounds Golden Retriever, well marinated, and then you take what did this. Say? Uh, 
golden retriever. Oh, oh, I forgot. You are Americans with your love affair of dogs. What? You look like you saw a ghost. I'm just kidding. There is nothing but plain old beef. What? You're not going to eat it now? Uh, it's just, it's a bit hard to get that image out of my mind. I, golden retriever, a dog, an animal on my plate. Uh, it's disgusting. That's just, it's not normal. So. So, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of you can, can appreciate this. Obviously, the man in this film is an actor. But if this experience were to happen in real life, chances are his reaction would be exactly the same. His experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. You know, so what changed was just his perceptions of the meat. And as vegan advocates, we recognize that um, perceptions of meat are illogical when it comes to eating animals. And we also recognize the role of perceptions. So we recognize that when people eat animals, typically there's a cognitive disconnect. What this means is that people don't make the connection between the meat on their plate and the living being it once was. When somebody is eating a cow, for instance, they're not, making, they're not having the image in their mind of the living animal. And because perceptions impact emotions, Okay, the diner's emotion, the diner did not feel empathy. He did not feel disgust when he thought he was eating a cow because his perception created a gap in his consciousness when it came to eating the cow. And emotion drives behavior. Very often, what vegans do is we define the problem and we target the problem of distorted perception. We recognize that meat eaters' distortions of animals, ed so-called edible animals, are distorted. So this is where we focus on the problem. So for instance, how many of you have used this argument before? Would you eat your dog? If you wouldn't eat your dog, then why are you eating a pig? Did you know that pigs are as intelligent as dogs? Have you heard this before? Have you used this before? How does it work for you? Is it effective? Do people say, oh, you're right, I'm going vegan. <laughs> It doesn't. Now, signs like this, Mercy for Animals is a great organization in the United States, and they do a very good job of raising awareness. And when people are ready to take this information in, it can really help. But many people do not respond to only intellectual argumentation. They don't respond because their perceptions are not logical for a reason. The real problem, it, perceptions don't exist in a vacuum. They come from somewhere. The real problem is the belief system that drives the perceptions. The belief system that the diner had enabled him to see cows as edible, for instance, and dogs as inedible. And the belief system that shapes perceptions, it creates a wall of defenses that maintain these distorted perceptions. We can't change perceptions as long as the defenses are intact. So, really, if we think about it, the diner was able to eat cows because he has a belief system that tells him that cows are edible and that creates a cognitive disconnect and blocks his emotions. Now, in meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals out of thousands of possible species that they've learned to classify as edible. All the rest we learn to classify as inedible and disgusting. And so even though the type of animal consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures typically see their own choices as rational and the choices of other cultures as irrational and often offensive to consume and disgusting. I want to talk for a minute about disgust. Anthropologists and psychologists have been um, investigating this phenomenon and they found some really interesting um, things that go along with disgust, some really interesting ideas. Disgust is considered to be ideational. 
What this means is that we feel disgust not about what a food is, but about the idea of the food, the meaning of the food. In other words, people tend to be disgusted at the idea of either breathing in, orally incorporating, either eating or smelling something that they find to be morally offensive. So, and this is different from distaste. Distaste means we don't like the flavor of a food. Can you see the difference? Right, so this is why vegans, for instance, are disgusted typically by all flesh, and um, meat eaters are only disgusted by 99.9% .9 of the flesh of animals. Disgust also is considered to be a moral emotion. It's morally charged. And it has what are called contamination properties. So to give you an example of what this means, let me ask you a question. Let's imagine that you are the diner in that video and that your host serves you a beef stew. And you say, I'm sorry, I'm vegan. I, I don't eat beef. And the host says, oh, that's okay. Just pick out the beef and eat the vegetables around it. Would you do that? I mean, some people might if you don't have a strong disgust response, and some people don't, but, but many people would not. Do you think the diner would pick out the golden retriever? No, because disgust has what's called contamination properties. When somebody is disgusted by a food, an object, then everything it touches becomes disgusting as well. So if you are at somebody's house for dinner and they tell you to pick off the ham from the salad, and you say no, and they say, oh, you're, you vegans, you're such a picky eater. You can say, no, if this were kitten, would you pick off the kitten and just eat the salad? Help them understand. Disgust is a bona fide psychological response. And I'm going to tell you one more point about disgust, but I want to use another example with this. Let's imagine that the diner was served not beef stew, but fruit salad. And let's say he's eating the fruit salad, and he says to his host, this apple is so sweet. I've never had an apple so sweet before. What kind of apple is it? And the host says, well, it's not really an apple. It's actually a salak. It's an Indonesian fruit. It grows on a tree. It's like an apple, but, but it's a different kind of fruit. Do you think he would have said, that's disgusting. I can't eat that. That's not normal. Probably not. Why not? What's the difference between the apple and the golden retriever? Apple's a fruit. Disgusting um, objects are all animal products. Typically, they're animal products, except for like rotten vegetation. Psychologists have found that people tend to be disgusted by the idea of eating flesh and animal excretions, and that the fruit, the plant products that disgust them are plants that are similar to or reminiscent of animal products. Like we say in English, mucusy. Does that word translate? Mucus? Swamp it. Swamp it? <laughs> like okra? Yeah. So, so the texture of vegetables that are slimy, for instance, um, like mucus. So this is some very interesting information. Now, I want to talk about this belief system that blocks the disgust response in people. To explain the belief system that I've been referring to, I want to do another quick exercise with you. If vegan is the term that we use to describe an individual who follows the tenets, the teachings of the belief system or ideology we call veganism, then what do we call somebody who is not a vegan or vegetarian? What are some common words that you use here that they probably translate Party the same? Line. Yeah. Carnivore. Right, so do you say omnivore also? Yeah, so and carnivore? Yeah. Okay, and I've been saying meat eater. Do you use this yeah, yeah. also? These are in, in, in English, and I think in, in many places in the world, these are the most common terms that we use. But let's talk for a minute about these terms. An omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, that can ingest both flesh and plant matter. And a carnivore is an animal that needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. 
So both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's ideological choice. If humans are naturally omnivorous, for example, and I know this point is debatable, then vegans would be omnivores just as people who eat animals, right? So we're talking about physiology or biology, not ideology. And Meat Eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. This is why we don't say plant eater when we describe vegans, right? Because we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a deeper ideology. We tend to assume that it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring our beliefs to the dinner table, but most people don't eat pigs, but not dogs, because they don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. And so this is why I began using the term carnism to describe the belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. Carnism is essentially the opposite of veganism. It's an invisible ideology that I call carnism, and this is what my writing and speaking has primarily been about um, recently. Carnism is a dominant ideology. It's the norm. It's the meat-eating norm. This means it's invisible, it's entrenched, it shapes norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And carnism is also a violent ideology. It's literally organized around physical violence. Meat cannot be procured without killing, and other animal products cannot be procured without causing some degree of harm to animals. And so Violent dominant ideologies like carnism need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms so that humane people can participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, this invisible ideology that is carnism, it teaches us how not to think and ultimately how not to feel. What carnism does is it blocks people's awareness of their cognitive moral dissonance. Cognitive moral dissonance is the term that psychologists, or the phrase that psychologists use to describe the internal moral discomfort that people feel when their values are not in alignment with their practices. It's the internal moral discomfort that we feel. So to give you an example of cognitive moral dissonance when it comes to eating animals, I'm going to share with you a quote from a meat eater I interviewed. I did my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And I interviewed meat eaters and meat cutters, butchers, and people who had raised and killed their own animals for food, and, and vegans and vegetarians. And I was interviewing this woman about her food choices and asking her what foods she regularly eats. And when I got to down my list and I asked her about eating meat, this was what she answered me. I mean, there are so many mortifying things in our culture and society, but killing animals for food certainly is one of the worst. And people ignore it the most because they think that animals don't matter. I feel a lot for these animals. Just the thought is really upsetting. And she started to cry when she talked to me. And then she looked at me and she said, I'm crying. She's a meat eater. So when we feel cognitive moral dissonance, which we all experience, unless you're Gandhi, or I mean, if you don't experience this, talk to me after because I want to interview you. Um, <laughs> We all experience that nobody lives perfectly in alignment with their values all the time, including Gandhi. Um, it's an uncomfortable feeling, so we seek to alleviate this discomfort. And we alleviate our moral discomfort by doing one of three things. And you all know the answer to this. What, what do you do? What do you think people do, meat eaters or ourselves, to alleviate the moral discomfort? We rationalize. We can rationalize. That's right, and that will be our third option. Um, what else? Excuses. We use excuses, similar. 
What else? What if we don't want to rationalize or use excuses? What if we want to get rid of it for real? We can block it out. Oh, you're good. You're all just so psychologically minded here. What if we don't want to play psychological games? What do we do? What did you do when to alleviate your moral discomfort with eating animals? You can change your behaviors, right? We, can, we have to get in alignment somehow. We can change our values. People can say, for example, well, you know, I know that animals suffer, but I'm just a bad person. I'm selfish, I don't care about animals, and I'm just, you know, I'm just not a good person. Most people are not going to change their core values. We found this through research. I don't know why we need, needed to research it, but we did. And most people need to think of themselves as living a moral life. We all need to. Or, as you pointed out, we can, we can change our behaviors. We can go vegan. As you know, often, this isn't what happens. The third option is the option that you all have been talking about, which is to change our perception of our behaviors so that it looks like our behaviors and our values are more in alignment. And it's around this third option that carnism is organized. Now, I talked about how um, carnism uses a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms. The primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it, right? And denial is expressed largely through invisibility. The main way that carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't even think about it. And then we can't question it, we can't challenge it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to just be a given. It's just the way things are, rather than a choice. Most people do not recognize that eating animals is, in fact, a choice. It's just what they've always done. And carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. Now, it's really important to point out that carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. Most of us here, everybody here, I'm sure, is aware of farmed animals as obviously the most direct and obvious victims of carnism. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware that the environment is a victim of carnism. Vegans are also victims of carnism. We have to live in a world that every day offends our deepest sensibilities and deal with hostility and defensiveness and many other problems that, that we've already mentioned briefly. We'll talk about vegans a little bit later. But it's really important for us to acknowledge these, these two sets of victims of the system. Often we see meat eaters only as perpetrators and not as victims. But when we recognize that carnism is invisible and that carnism has effectively shaped meat eaters' choices, guided them like an invisible hand, so that people who eat animals make choices that are against their own interest and counter to their own values and harmful to their own bodies, then we can recognize that, you know, to some degree, that this is not a free choice that they are making. They're choosing to eat animals, but without awareness, there's no free choice victims of a system that has conditioned them to act against their own interests. And meat packers and slaughterhouse workers, often in the United States, they're undocumented immigrants, um, non-English speaking immigrants. And I know around the world, even when they're not immigrants, these are people who have to work in a very highly dangerous, death-saturated environment and are deeply exploited. And most people do this job because they have no choice and they end up traumatized from doing the job. I think personally that it's really important that we shine a spotlight on carnism. It's very important in my opinion that vegans encourage meat eaters to recognize this system um, because often dominant systems maintain themselves by remaining unexamined. 
It's like there's vegans and vegetarians, and then there's everybody else. Now, invisibility alone is not enough to protect the entire system that's carnism. And, I mean, if you think about it, invisibility is not even foolproof. I mean, hints of the truth are surround us. There are dead animals everywhere we turn, right, in the form of meat. So when invisibility inevitably falters, carnism needs a backup, a safety net. So we need to justify eating animals. And the way that people learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat are the facts of meat. Now there's a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall under what I call the three ends of justification. If you had to guess what they are, what do you think they would be? Natural. Oh, that was fast. Natural. What else? Necessary. Necessary. Nutritious. Nutritious, we'll come to that, but people always say nutritious. Close. Normal, natural, and necessary. You've heard this before, I'm guessing, right? And nutritious, I think of as falling under necessary, right? Necessary for health. Um, I do this exercise, I'm on a speaking tour now, and I give a different presentation to meat-eating audiences. And I do this exercise with people, um, with meat-eating audiences, and people always guess that so quickly. I say, what do you think the three ends would be? And I, I used to time them because I was fascinated by how quickly they guessed, and it was under one second once, so I stopped timing them. Everybody knows. Why do you think that everybody knows the answer to this? It's just logical because we've heard these same arguments so many times before. These same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history. For example, slavery, male dominance, heterosexual supremacy. We've heard this all before. So I want to just briefly, before we talk about advocacy, I want to briefly talk about these myths themselves, each of these myths. So eating meat is normal. Well, what we call normal is really just the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture, right? It, it's the carnistic norm. And carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that people are unable to see this as long as they are inside the carnistic box. So the example I like to use to explain this one is that most people would not condone, would not support, for example, killing a golden retriever who is perfectly healthy and six months old just because they like the way her thighs taste, even if she had a good life, even if for six months she was able to run around and play and form friendships with other golden retrievers and some people, most people would say that's totally unacceptable. And yet many people today have no problem allowing the same thing to happen to somebody of a different species. Carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it blinds people to the fact that humane meat, most people don't see this as a myth. A myth that was constructed by those in the business of violence to appeal to people who would ordinarily never support such violence. Well, how about eating meat is natural? This one is probably the most commonly, right? Have you heard this a lot? Yeah. It's natural. We've done this forever, right? Humans are supposed to eat animals. But what we call natural is just the dominant culture's interpretation of history. Right? It's, it's not looking at human history, it's looking at carnistic history. For example, we don't refer to our fruit-eating ancestors. We refer to their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, we only look as far back in history as we need to, to justify current carnistic practices. And to be fair, murder, rape, and infanticide, killing infants, are arguably as long-standing and therefore as natural as eating animals. And yet we don't use the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. As my friend and the author Colleen Patrick Goudreau says, 
do we really want to use the behavior of the Neanderthals <laughs> as the yardstick by which to measure current moral choices? Can't we do better than that? And finally, eating meat is necessary. Well, what we call necessary is simply what is necessary to maintain the dominant culture. It's what's necessary to maintain the carnistic status quo. And that's all. And I will let a picture speak for itself, but I know in the back you may not be able to see all these numbers. This is the animal kill counter. This is the number of animals killed globally since I opened this page. Now, for the people who said eating meat is nutritious, you are probably referring to this. Right? How many times have you been asked this question? Where do you get your protein? Well, everybody in this room knows that this is a myth. This has been proven by the medical establishment to be a myth, or at least significantly demonstrated to be a myth. For example, did you know that you could be strong enough to lift a car without having eaten an ounce of animal protein in your life? Really? <laughs> Of course. You know, John F. Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and, and neither should we. Even if we have stepped outside of the carnistic box, it's important that we recognize how powerful myths are. Because the myths of meat prevail despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And they prevail largely because carnism is so entrenched. It's embraced and maintained by all major social institutions, from the family to the state. It's become self-perpetuating. There's a quote that I like to use that gives an example of an, of an entrenched system. It's from a 19th century French political economist. And he said, when plunder becomes a way of life, we create for ourselves, in the course of time, a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And when we are born into an entrenched system, such as carnism, we inevitably absorb that system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We all learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of uh, defenses that distort our perceptions of meat and the animals we eat so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For example, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects so that we learn to refer to this turkey as something rather than someone. Or we learn to call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any personality or individuality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a group about which we've made generalized assumptions, right? A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. So for example, I'm going to share a quote with you from a meat cutter, a butcher that I interviewed, who said this to me. I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing with its own name and its own characteristics, its own little games that it plays? Yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. A female meat eater I interviewed told me that she eats all different types of meat, chicken and pork and beef, and when I asked her if she also ate veal, she stopped. She got quiet, she looked very offended. And what she answered was, 
Let's just say I came to your house and you told me that I had just eaten veal. I'd probably vomit, like I have to get that out of my system. And when I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby. I can't eat a baby. When we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this or like this. I mean, somebody mutilating their own body to be eaten. And we learn to take no notice rather than take offense. Or we see images like this or this, and we, we learn to laugh rather than cry. If you think about it, Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are similar. It's because the mentality that enables that violence is the same. It's the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It's the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power, just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals. It's the mentality of meat. So if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will be doomed to recreate atrocities in new forms. And this is why it's so important, especially as advocates, that we get people to incorporate all oppressive systems into their awareness, into their analysis, including carnism. Eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It's the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive -ism. Eating animals is really a social justice issue. And I can't um, express strongly enough how important I think it is for vegan advocates to work to get eating animals included on the map, onto the map of social justice issues so that we can all work together. Martin Luther King said, you might be familiar with this quote, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He recognized the interconnectedness of oppressions. And justice anywhere is also a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice can be practiced everywhere, including on our plates. So the question for us is how do we get people to practice justice on their plates? So knowing what we know about carnism, this brings us to the second question. What do we do about it? How do we transform denial into awareness? I want to begin to address this question with a question for you. What do you think is the reason that people use defenses in the first place? Why do you think carnism needs to use this, this fortress of defenses? Uh, they don't want to feel like a bad person. People don't want to feel like a bad person. Exactly. People care. I have been speaking about this issue for a long time now, 20 years. I've been speaking about eating animals and animal agriculture, and people care. People care about animals, and they care about the truth. And carnism depends on their not caring, and the system is built on deception. I have very rarely seen a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animal suffering. So the good news is that carnism is a, a house of cards. It's a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents. Why else would people need to use all the psychological acrobatics if not because they care? And so 
People's caring is both the problem and the solution. People's caring is what makes them want to turn away from atrocities. And our caring is also what gives us the courage to see the truth of what is happening. The courage to bear witness. Now I mentioned witnessing at the beginning of this presentation, um, and I want to make sure this is clear. When we bear witness, this means we're willing to see the truth with our minds, cognitively, but also with our hearts, emotionally. On a cognitive level, when we bear witness, this means we identify with another. It, this means that we see something of them in ourselves and something of ourselves in them. Even if the only thing we identify with is the desire not to suffer. When we bear witness, we also empathize with another. We look at the world through their eyes so that when we make choices that impact them, we ask ourselves, what would he or she want us to do? Now, so many people tell me, vegans tell me, that, that one of the things that's so difficult for them is when they have friends and family or people they advocate to who see like, or have you seen earthlings? Is earthlings? Yeah. Okay. Who see something like earthlings, or they see undercover footage of factory farms, CAFOs, and those same people continue to eat animals. And they say, how can you see this and still make the choice, right? Have you experienced this? It's frustrating and it's confusing. That's because they haven't fully witnessed. Witnessing has to happen in the heart. If people only see with their eyes and their minds, often that's not enough to motivate them to take action. When people bear witness, this happens on an internal level first. They take in the truth, and then it can be practiced on an external level. Then they can actively become witnesses and work toward change. Witnessing is really the Achilles heel of carnism. The whole system is organized to block witnessing on an individual level and on a collective level. And we cannot force people to witness, but what we can do is we can create an environment that creates space for witnessing. When you show somebody a film, for example, you can't force them to witness because you can't force them to open their hearts, and opening your heart is fundamental to witnessing. So I want to talk about how we can create an environment that helps people bear witness to our message. One of the most important things we can do is to focus on the process of a conversation, not the content. The process is the how. How do we communicate? The content is what we are communicating about. If you have a healthy process, it doesn't matter what the content is. It doesn't matter if you're talking about or debating whether to go out or stay home on a Saturday evening, or whether you are debating or discussing whether to eat animals or go vegan. The process is the same. A healthy process is the same. And a healthy process means that your goal of the communication is to relate rather than to win. What this means is that the goal of the conversation is to share the truth of your experience and to hear the truth of somebody else's experience. The goal is not to be right. When you're talking about veganism, how often do you find that your goal is to win, to make somebody go vegan? Can you relate to this? I want to be right. I want you to see that I'm right and I know that I'm right. Well, it, it's true that you know veganism is the most compassionate choice to make, but if you approach a conversation with that agenda in mind, well, think about it. When somebody talks to you and their goal is to make you agree with them, how do you feel? You notice, right? You always know, we can tell, even if the person isn't obvious. So how do we do this? How can we relate to people in a way that, that, that is um, cooperative? One way to do this effectively is to share your own story. 
Okay, when I'm talking to groups of meat eaters, which I do very frequently, as I said, I'm, I'm on a speaking tour, so I speak to large groups of meat eaters almost every weekend now. And I communicate through my own story. It, whoever I'm talking to, I share my own story. That's me, by the way, a very long time ago. Um, nobody can disagree with your story. Nobody can make your story wrong. So when somebody asks you about veganism, instead of saying, for instance, if somebody says, why are you vegan? Do you get this a lot if you say I'm vegan and people say, why? Why are you vegan? Right? Well, we have a choice. That's an incredible opportunity. We have a choice. We can say, I'm vegan because 10 billion animals or 65 billion animals a year die globally because eating meat is, and eggs and dairy is the single worst thing you can do for the environment because you'll get heart disease and cancer. We can do that, but we can also say, I'm vegan because, well, you know, I learned about what happens, and when I learned about this information, I thought to myself, huh, I don't want to be a part of that, and I made choices that I felt were really more reflective of who I am and what I believe. You can share your own story. People are much more likely to hear you when you share your own story. One um, point is, when you're sharing your story even, is to, to find common ground, to find a common connection. Now, I want to just take a quick poll. How many people in this room, at some point in your life, ate flesh, eggs, or dairy? Just let me see. Wow, okay. So, one of the most powerful and important things that you have in common with meat eaters is your own carnism. Remember your own carnism. When we become vegan, it's so easy for us to forget. Do you ever forget what it felt like to eat animals? And it's like meat eaters can see us as fundamentally different from them. It's so important to remember that we were not always vegan. When people say to me, oh, are you vegan? When I start talking about the title of my book or what I do, they say, oh, you're vegan then, right? Um, I always answer, I am today, but for much of my life, I wasn't. And that's what motivated me to do the work that I do. And then I talk about my own experience. As soon as you say, I'm vegan today, but for much of my life, I wasn't, you probably will notice that the person becomes much more open. Oh, you understand me. You can see the world through my eyes. You're not thinking, I'm a bad person. I'm fundamentally different from you. We have something in common. It's also useful to indirectly illuminate carnistic defenses. And I'll explain what this means in a minute. Carnistic defenses lose a lot of their power when they are exposed. So, for instance, when I'm talking, I, I share my story of my own defenses. So when I'm telling somebody about my story, I'll say, you know, I knew, I heard information, a little bit of information about the horrors of animal agriculture, but I wasn't ready to really take that information in, so I always said, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. Or I say, when I ate animals, you know, I, I knew on some level that whenever I ate meat, someone had to die for my plate, but I just didn't make the connection. I had a knowing without knowing. And when I'm explaining my story to somebody who eats animals and I'm talking about my defenses, you know what they're doing? They're going... <laughs> so by illuminating defenses, it reduces defenses. And I'm not saying to do this in a strategic or manipulative way. It's the truth. You're sharing the truth of your experience. And for all of us, we grew up in this system, we looked at the world through the lens of this system, and we internalized the same defenses that the people that we're talking to have. A really important point is to not expect the facts to sell the ideology. How many of you relate to this? If only you knew the truth with a capital T about eating animals, you'd never eat animals again. And then we tell them about the truth over and over and over and over and over again, and nothing happens. How does it feel? 
Yeah, incredibly frustrating. I have talked to thousands of vegans, and you know, over the years, people can become misanthropic. They can become, they can really lose faith in humanity. They can start thinking that you know, humans are a bunch of psychopaths that just don't care about anything except their own selfish desires, because we expect the facts to sell the ideology. And when they don't, and we say, but wait a minute, you know the truth and you still eat animals, you must be a psychopath or something. You have no empathy. Well, that's not the case. And, you know, we have to remember that carnism creates an illogical loyalty to eating animals. It's not logical. It's so important that we engage with the meat eater, not their defenses. Very often what happens is we get so frustrated. We tell the truth and nothing changes, and then we get into an argument of justifications back and forth. The whole conversation is defensive. So for example, we might say, oh, but we wouldn't have to worry about what to do with all the farmed animals if people went vegan overnight. Well, if people went vegan because we wouldn't be breeding them in the first place, right? So, oh, we're, well, what if you had to kill the animal yourself? Would you eat animals then? No, you're a hypocrite, right? So we can go back and forth with justifications. Some justifications need to be addressed. If a person really believes they're going to get sick or die if they go vegan, they need to know that that's not true. But very often, justifications are a distraction from the real issue. The real issue is the, on the feeling level. Sharing our story is one way to address that. It helps to appreciate the meaning of meat. The reason that the facts don't sell the ideology, in large part, is because when we ask somebody to stop eating meat, we are not just asking for a change of behavior, we're asking for a shift of consciousness. It's, if it was just asking for a change of behavior, the world would be vegan. You can get a vegan hamburger that is so realistic some vegans, including myself, can't eat it. It tastes too real sometimes. It would be simple. We're not asking only for a change of behavior. We're asking for people to change the whole way they see the world, themselves, and their relationship with others, including other animals and themselves. We're asking people to, for instance, see themselves as a strand in the web of life rather than standing on top of the so-called hierarchical ladder of life. We're asking for people to step outside of the dominant carnistic norm and to become part of a minority. And this is empowering, but it's challenging. Maybe you can relate to this. I mean, sometimes relationships suffer when people become vegan, when people in their lives have not become vegan. We're asking people to take this on. We're asking for people to open to the reality of animal suffering in this world. And once you allow yourselves to take that truth in, your life is never the same. So we're asking for a shift of consciousness. And people do not make that kind of change unless they are ready to. People cannot make that change until they feel ready to, psychologically, socially, and on a practical level. So, one way that we can help people feel ready or feel safe enough to hear our message so that they'll change when they're ready is to view them as victims, not the enemy. Victims of the system, not the enemy. Remember that carnism creates this us versus them mentality. It's this divide and conquer mentality that is very effective in maintaining the dominant system. I mean, how can we possibly expect to reach a critical mass of supporters if we see the people that we are reaching out to as the enemy? We have to see meat eaters as victims of the system. One way to do this is to separate character from behavior. Mother Teresa was not a vegan. Mother Teresa was not even a vegetarian. But in many ways, she was a very good person, right? So we can appreciate that good people do harmful things, and this doesn't make them bad people. 
People eat animals, and they're also great humanitarians. They're teachers, they're community leaders, they're loving fathers and sisters and daughters. When we separate character from behavior, it helps us to avoid falling into the trap of what I call reductive thinking. Reductive thinking is when you reduce a person to nothing other than a behavior, right? You're a meat eater. We reduce a person to nothing other than that. And you know, the example I like to use to describe reductive thinking is, um, I don't know what it's like here, but in Boston where I live, I, I try to practice nonviolence in thought and behavior. And when I get into my car in Boston, it takes about five minutes before my nonviolent thoughts are gone. I reduce the car that inevitably cuts me off. All, in my mind, automatically, the person in that car is not a person anymore. They're just the jerk driver. They become nothing other than that jerk driver who cut me off. Or worse, it's the Volkswagen that cut me off. This happens to us as vegans so often automatically, especially if we are eating around somebody who's eating animals. So in our mind, they can very quickly go from this to this. <laughs> can you appreciate this feeling? So to avoid reductive thinking, it helps for us to view meat eaters as individuals rather than as people that have a certain practice. We are all so much more than just our ideology. I'm a vegan, I'm obviously, it's my profession, it's my, my work, but I am so much more than just a vegan. I'm a, I'm a friend, I'm a daughter, I'm a colleague, I'm a teacher, I'm an ex-girlfriend, I'm many things, more than just being a vegan. And meat eaters as well. For many of us, we have more in common with some meat eaters than we do with some vegetarians or some vegans in our lives. It helps to avoid all or nothing thinking. I like to think of carnism on a continuum, right? You could be like a hardcore meat eater over here, meaning you eat meat 10 times a day, you brush your teeth with it, I don't know. <laughs> and, and, over, and I don't think I know anybody who is perfectly over here. I mean, I have my vegan shoes on, but I don't know if the glue in the heels of my shoe came from somebody's hooves. You know, we do our best. So most important, in my opinion, is not where we are on the continuum. It's where we're headed on the continuum. When, when people learn about me being vegan, you know, often they'll say, wait, wait a minute, what, you're vegan, so you only eat chicken and fish? <laughs> no, you, no, not even cheese. You, well, do you wear leather? You don't wear leather? What about wool? Why don't you wear wool? They just take the hair off the sheep. The, you know, and then on and on. Then finally they say, where do you draw your line? You know, and what they're asking is, where do you draw your line around your circle of compassion? And I always respond, it's not where I draw my line that's important to me. It's how I relate to my line. You know, do you draw your line in pencil? And so our goal as vegans is really to encourage meat eaters to reflect on their line. That's it. My friend, the author I mentioned before, Colleen Patrick Goudreau says, the only thing that we can do really effectively when we're communicating is to plant seeds. We can plant seeds. We can't make people go vegan. If that's our goal, we'll be frustrated all the time. We can plant seeds. This is my truth. You will do with it what you need to. It takes a lot of the stress away. Because many people, many vegans have said to me, I feel guilty when I don't turn people vegan. And they feel somehow as though if people don't go vegan after a conversation with them, then they are personally responsible for killing animals. That's a heavy burden. Harry. And that makes us push harder, which, as we know, is less effective. So our goal is to plant seeds. That's all. In order to do this, we need to ultimately model the qualities that we are asking for 
you know? So don't expect behaviors in others that we're not practicing ourselves. If we want people to be open and reflective, we have to be open and reflective. If we want people to be compassionate, we have to be compassionate. Is it fair that we have to be on our best behavior in order for our message to be heard? No, but it is the truth. It's hard to model these behaviors when we're feeling frustrated and tired and burned out. So I'm going to very briefly talk, you know, in conclusion about ways to take care of ourselves so that we're more likely to be able to practice some of these things that we've talked about, these principles that we've talked about. And one of the most important things we can do is to acknowledge the insanity of carnism. Okay? Carnism is it's an insane system. It, it's totally illogical. And this causes conflicting emotions, right? We have to love people whose behaviors we hate. We have to respect people whose beliefs might offend us. And it's helpful to, rather than trying to fix these contradictions, to accept them. Just accept them. They are a natural part of living in a culture that is organized around illogical thinking and contradictions. Life becomes easier if we give ourselves permission to love meat eaters, even if we don't love what they do. How many of you have noticed that your relationships have been a little bit stressful because of veganism? Anybody? Okay, so a lot of people in this room. Do you find sometimes that it's hard for you to continue to love people or feel connected with them when they're still eating animals? It is hard. Sometimes we just need to say we can love people and not love what they do. And that makes life a lot easier and it helps us to communicate with more compassion and more effectively. Loving a meat eater, it doesn't make you a hypocrite. It just makes you authentic makes you practicing the things that we've been talking about. I always recommend for vegans not to internalize carnism. Even for those of us who have stepped outside of the system, we're still living inside of the system. And one of the ways that dominant ideologies or dominant systems like carnism maintain themselves is by uh, promoting negative messages about the people and the movements that challenge them, right? If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. And often vegans can internalize these negative messages. So, for instance, have you ever been called overly emotional? Right, because this is, this is what happens to proponents, has happened to proponents of all social movements, feminists, people working in civil rights, overly emotional. When it comes to the atrocity of the animals, the world needs more emotion, not less. When we are called overly emotional, this is a way of discrediting our argument because it means if you're too emotional, what does that mean? You are not rational, rational right? It's a way of silencing. It's not true. If, you're, if you feel the emotions of anger, and sadness and grief at what's happening to the animals in the world, those emotions are normal, helpful, legitimate, and appropriate. This is what the numb, carnistic culture looks at as overly emotional, only in comparison with an under-emotional dominant culture. Often we're token. To be a token something means to be that you become the representative for the entire group, right? So, like, how many of you, as the vegan, you feel like you always are representing veganism, so you have to represent it well, right? I'll pretend I never get sick, because if they know I get sick, then they're going to say it's because you're vegan and it's going to have a negative impact on the movement. So we become the token ambassadors. That's a lot of stress to carry. Often we become tokenized. Guys, we're called picky. Oh, you're such a picky eater, you know? You won't just pick out the meatballs and eat the pasta sauce. We've already talked about this. You can say, no, I'm having a disgust response. It's a legitimate psychological reaction. <laughs> a psychologist told me so. <laughs> we are hypocrites if we wear leather, extremists if we don't. 
If we express our anger about what's happening to the animals, then we're militant human haters. If instead we don't talk from anger, but we talk from wanting peace and compassion, then we are eater, tree-hugging, tofu-loving hippies. And to proselytize, propagandize might be, to, to promote propaganda, right? It's, it's similar. So when, we, when vegans share information about the benefits of eating a vegan diet, we can be called sharing propaganda. When meat eaters share information about you know, nutrients in eating animals, that's not propaganda, that's just information. Right? So, so recognizing these, it is essential to not internalizing, not believing them. Because holding on to our truth the dominant culture tries to make us question our own truth. Hold on to your truth. Believing and living your truth is the greatest threat to powers that be. So one issue that I like to mention, and I'm just going to mention this very briefly, is to, to recognize STSD. This is called secondary traumatic stress disorder. How many of you have heard of PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder? That translates, right? So like combat veterans have this. STSD is the same in many ways as PTSD, but it's what happens to people who are witnesses to violence, not the direct victims of violence. Many of us who are fighting atrocities, who are working to raise awareness of atrocities, can become traumatized by them. And can feel, maybe you have felt this, can feel burnout, can feel um, like a loss of faith in humanity, a loss of faith in the world, in the universe. This happens sometimes when we overwitness, when we see too much. I have so many vegans tell me, I watched Earthlings again. Again? <laughs> what? Well, because I wanted my friends to see it and I felt like if the animals are suffering so much, then for me to spend 20 minutes or one hour of my life, that's nothing compared to the animals except that this person is, of course, traumatized. And the more we witness, we don't need to witness, when you already know what's happening, you don't need to see over and over and over again the images, because they can have a negative impact over time. Maybe you have experienced it, you can't get the images out of your mind, they come to your mind when, they don't, when you don't want them to. Don't overwitness, and get witnessed. Find people who you can talk to, Maybe you don't share the graphic details, but who see you? To be witnessed is to be seen. When we live in a dominant carnistic culture that turns away from veganism, then we as vegans can feel invisible too. We can feel invisible in very profound ways. So it's so important to find people who see who you are and what you do and validate that so the culture doesn't minimize or dismiss you in that way. This book, by the way, Trauma Stewardship, is an excellent, excellent book, a practical book for taking care of ourselves. All right, I'm gonna, we'll wrap up, we've got two more. Okay, appreciate your burden of knowing and expect that others won't. Um, people in your life cannot see who you are until they're ready to see the truth about carnism. Two more quick points. Don't let carnistic culture minimize your impact or dismiss your beliefs or efforts. Often vegans will say that the problem is still so big, even though all our, we've been working so hard. Well, remember the problem would be even bigger. You are the only thing that is standing between animals and a worse situation for them. There is reason to hope. In the United States, the number of vegans and vegetarians has doubled in the past three years. We've got articles coming out about veganism, leaders, celebrities saying no to veganism, Ellen has her own website about veganism. The culture, the vegan culture is just exploding everywhere. It is expanding exponentially and one way carnism maintains itself is by making it seem like veganism is not nearly as powerful or growing as much as it is, but it is. And my very last point is to find out what inspires you. Remember that you're part of something that's greater than your individual self. You're part of a social movement that in my belief 
is going to be looked back upon one day as one of the most important and influential and transformational revolutions in the history of humankind, and you're a part of that. Remember that you're not alone, and find out what inspires you. What inspires me is meeting you, is talking to people and witnessing what you do, and, um, and being reminded of how important this work really is and how many people are really active in this work. So I want to wrap up by just saying to you, thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. You are the reason that the world is a better place for animals. And you are the reason that I can continue to do what I do. You recharge my vegan batteries and you inspire me and you make me want to be a better activist and a better person. So thank you. Thank you for coming.